continue. But here, not until the 22nd of, uh, of April. So we're going to go on with, um, with Mark 13, finishing off Mark 13. And let's, uh, let's start with a prayer. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you to thank you for all our meetings here at the venue, for being able to go through the life of your dear son, chapter by chapter, over the last few months. And we pray, yet again, that he will become real for us, and that we will meet him again, as it were, for the first time, and that we will love him and surrender our lives totally and absolutely in every part of them to him and to his cause and to his kingdom and have him as our Lord, our Saviour, and our Master. We pray, Father, that you will strengthen us again today as again we come to him and to his words for his sake. Amen. Amen. So, we've been going through Mark 13. It's talking about the signs leading up to the Lord's coming. And we said that um, some of them, well, you could say, yeah, the world's always been in a bad, bad space and, you know, things have always been getting worse and worse. But there are some of the signs he gives that definitely can only come true, can only possibly have a fulfillment in our days. And one of them, I said, was the gospel going into all the world. And then shall the end come, the Lord said. Well, here's another one. Verse 28. Now from the fig tree, learn its lesson. When its branch becomes tender, puts forth its leaves, you know that the summer is near. So you also, when you see these things happening, you will know that he is near at the doors. Truly I say to you, this generation shall not pass away until all these things happen. So, he wraps up this Olivet prophecy with a specific sign about the fig tree. And he says, the generation that sees the fig tree just beginning to put forth leaves, that generation will, will see all this, will see the Lord's coming. So, we want to know, well, what's this about? We remember... We looked not so long ago, last week I think, at the Lord's meeting with a fig tree that was putting forth its leaves. Right, so it's very similar. And what was that story about? Well, he's starving hungry. Jesus was hungry. And he sees a fig tree that's got leaves. But it wasn't the time of fruit, but he saw it had leaves. He goes to the fig tree, but, well, behind the leaves, there's absolutely nothing. And I said that the fig tree represented Israel. In the old days, when we had paper Bibles instead of apps on your phone, in uh, Mark 13 and Luke 21, I, in my paper Bible, I, I used to have some Israeli stamps with a fig tree on it. I was rather proud of them. That the fig tree represents Israel. Right, <clears throat> so... The Lord Jesus was hungry, and he came to that fig tree looking just for anything, just for a little bit of immature fruit. And so the point I made was that Jesus was so hungry, he would have even taken the little bit of immature fruit, hard, tough, not very tasty, give your tummy ache, uh, that was behind the leaves, and eaten it. But this fig tree only had leaves. It didn't have that fruit, even the little beginnings of it. And I said that the Lord Jesus is willing to accept even the most immature bit of spiritual fruit. What is the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, pace. No, no, no. Start again. Love, joy, peace, patience, self-control, and so forth. And have you and me got that? A bit? <laughs> A little bit? A bit immature, very immature, but yeah, something... You see, that's what the Lord's looking for, not perfection. And I said that Jesus is not a perfectionist. He's just looking for the beginnings. But with the fig tree, that fig tree, there was nothing. There was just leaves. There was no fruit, even the most immature fruit. There was just the appearance of fruit through the leaves. And he got mad with it. And he cursed it. And he said, may you never bear fruit again forever. And the fig tree withered and died. Now, at the end of this Olivet prophecy, <clears throat> he picks up this picture again. And he says, when you see the fig tree, when he says, from the fig tree learn its lesson, he was talking to the disciples, right, who would have all remembered the fig tree of a few days ago that had leaves and had been cursed because it had no fruit. So he says, now, from the fig tree, you remember the fig tree? Yeah, Israel, no spiritual fruit. 
Well, he says, when it begins even just to put forth leaves, which is normally in the springtime, you know that summer's near. So when you see that, the generation that sees that will see my coming. What's that saying? It's saying that when in Israel, <clears throat> amongst the Jewish people, the fig tree, when you see just the beginning of spiritual fruit, that's the generation that will see the Lord coming. Well, how's that going to happen? If you go to Israel today and try and preach the gospel, as, as I've done many times, I even got a law that says you cannot, you cannot preach. You cannot preach in Israel. Right? It's so touchy about our thing. Yeah, you can baptize non-Jewish people, but oh no, it's a totally different story. And as soon as you talk to Jewish folks about crucifying the Lord Jesus and repentance, oh man. You know, they go bonkers. <laughs> With all due respect. So, how is this going to happen? How is there going to be repentance and spiritual fruit on the fig tree? Well, I'm afraid it, as for all of us here, repentance and spiritual fruit didn't come easy. It has to be, I'm afraid, in our cases, through suffering. And so, the, the general picture of both the Old and the New Testament is that Israel, the people of Israel, are going to suffer terribly and then that leads them to repent and to cry out to God, we know that you're true and we know your son was Jesus and that we crucified him, please forgive us and please send him to save us and the heavens will open and Jesus will come back and the kingdom of God will be established here on the earth. And so the Lord says, when you see even the slightest beginnings of that fruit, you know. Now, we haven't seen it yet. What we're seeing at the moment is Israel with the IDF, Israeli Defense Forces, apparently so tough and strong. But you know, they're not going to stay like that. Zechariah 14, Jerusalem will be captured, it will fall. Women will be raped in the streets and the party in Israel will be over. It's not going to go on like that. It is. That's clearly what the Bible says. And that will lead them to repentance. Now you can whip your phone out and think, oh, what's going on on the news? Check your favorite uh, news channel. Oh, wow, Iran has thrown nuclear weapons at Israel. There's been a huge invasion of Israel and the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, have been overwhelmed, overrun. Uh, there is now uh, Muslims taken over uh, Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. Uh, has uh, surrendered, whoops, no, that could happen, honestly, no kidding, you check your phone, it's happened. You know, that is absolutely on the cards, something like that. Whereas previously, for, you know, centuries and centuries, such a, a possibility was not even there. So I think this is one sign, or the beginning of a sign, that shows us that, yes, we are in the last days. But as I said to you before, whether or not the Lord Jesus comes in our lifetime doesn't make any difference. If you are baptized into Jesus Christ and you are in Christ, then you are assured, absolutely assured, that as the song says, because he lives, we shall live also. Because he lives, I will live also. Big deal. No big deal. If we die, we're going to die at some point, and we will be resurrected like him and live forever. And you see, that's why I keep pleading with you on my hands and knees to get baptized into Jesus, into that death and resurrection. Just like that. You know me, there's no agenda. I haven't got any agenda at all. Just straight up. Simple as that. So, <clears throat> that generation will not pass. But he says, 29, when you see these things happening, you will know that he is near at the door. But all the teaching of Jesus kind of fits together in a sort of seamless kind of way. And he says, in talking to the churches in the book of Revelation, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man open, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. So, yes, the second coming of Jesus is like Jesus coming to your door. But, in essence, he is knocking at the door of every man and woman right now. In essence, he's there, knocking on the door of your heart. And if any man open, I will let him in, and I will come into him and eat with him. Now, we who live in 
the UK and Europe in a sort of individualized society, for us maybe that is kind of um, quite normal. Although I am at home in my flat and there's a knock on the door and a friend comes around and I say, yeah, come in, open the door, I let him in and we have a something to eat together. But don't forget, in their society, it wasn't quite like that. People didn't live alone. That's something of you know, the last hundred years or so here in Europe. Everybody lived in um, some kind of big family, extended family. And is it only the very poor or the marginalized or the weird or the odd, the rejected, who lived alone? So that's a strange figure for the Lord to use when he says, I stand at the door and knock, and if a man opens to me, I'll go into him. I'll go into his place and I will eat with him and he'll eat with me. Which again sort of kind of sounds obvious that if I eat with you, well then you eat with me kind of thing. Um, but the idea that he's giving is of two-way friendship and relationship between Jesus who's knocking on the door of some rejected, odd, non-standard person who's living on their own. Which, as I say, isn't unusual in our society, but for them that stood out like a sore thumb. Oh, he's li living on your own? Oh, what's what, you fell out with your, with your family? Um, everyone had a family, you know, in those days. Oh, you fell out with them? Oh, whoops. Uh, yeah. So they were rejected. Um, they were the odd ones, or you were thought to be weird uh, in some way, or non-standard in some way, and so therefore you had to live on your own. And so that sort of cuts it with us, does it not? Because we can all relate to that. We all feel that I am the non-standard. I am odd. I, am, I may be in the flow of things, but in my heart I am totally isolated. Yeah, right. That's how it is. And the Lord Jesus in that sense is for us. And he wants us to open that door and he will come in and eat with us and we with him. And of course to eat together was a sign of acceptance and fellowship. We're going to take the bread and the juice which is an eating with him. That is a sign of his acceptance. And that's why that table is totally open. That, as the Jews say, the reformed Judaism anyway, in the synagogue at Passover, whoever is hungry, come and eat. And that's it. Please let me eat with you. That's what he's saying. So, yeah, I think the situation with uh, Israel and so forth is looking forward to this. But as I said before, there is not a calendar date when the Lord Jesus will come back. It's not that God set it up for the 6th of April, I don't know, 2029 at 10 past 3 GMT London Croydon time. No. What he's done is set conditions. That's why, as I said to you when the, uh, the other day, when, when the, um, the disciples say to, to Jesus, well, when are you coming back? He basically says, go and preach the gospel. Because he has set conditions, not a date as such. When the gospel goes into all the world, then shall the end come. When the harvest is ripe, then it is reaped. When there is fruit on the fig tree, to it, that, that is specifically in Israel, the Jewish folks, then that generation will see the Lord's coming. So he says, 32, Of that day or that hour knows no one except the Father, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son. So... Why don't they know the day or the hour? Because there isn't a day or hour. There are conditions, not a specific day and hour. And all this talk that you see on social media, oh, some guys predicted that Jesus is coming back. You remember during the lockdown, during COVID, there was all this stuff about, oh, Jesus is coming back. Oh, this is a sign of the end. Well, you know, wrong again. He didn't, didn't come, did he? Uh, because it's not like that. It, it's not that the Bible has given us a chronology ahead of time and the game is to match world events with what the Bible says and therefore hey I know Jesus is coming back on such and such a date no nonsense he has set conditions God has if you like how to put it set objectives in history and that's what he's working towards Right, so he says, 33, be warned, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. So actually, it's exactly because you do not know when he's coming, 
that you have got to watch and pray and be bright and bushy-tailed waiting for him to come back because you don't know when he's coming back. Now, as the Lord said in various other parables, you know, he, he said that it, it, it's like um, ten, uh, ten girls, five wise, five foolish, the wise and foolish virgins. And they uh, went out to, to meet the, uh, the bridegroom. They all took their lamps with them, which were, of course, not torches with Duracell in them, but... Um, but oil lamps with oil, and well, he delayed. He stayed longer than they thought, and their lamps went out because they all fell asleep. And then when the cry went up, he's back, the foolish ones hadn't taken any extra oil. They went off to buy some oil. The wise ones had taken some extra oil. They put that in their lamps, and yes, they went to meet the bridegroom. By the time the other girls had gone to buy some oil, come back, knock on the door, and the bridegroom says, I don't know who you are, go away. So, in that picture of the whole thing, we in the last days are to stay awake. Watch, it means stay awake. Stay awake and pray. But in that other parable of Jesus, he shows that actually his people don't stay awake, they fall asleep. Paul's very clear in Thessalonians where he says that let us not sleep as do others but let us watch and be sober let us not sleep but actually they do sleep in the parable of the wise and foolish virgins and they shouldn't do but they did so I think what that's saying is that when the Lord comes his people the whole lot of them including those who will be saved will not be as ready and bright and bushy-tailed as they should be. And the wise are only saved because they realise their weakness and they realise the possibility of his delay and they take a bit of extra oil with them. And that's it, that's the difference. Knowing your fallibility, that's it. So he says, watch and pray because you don't know when the time is. And we are to live as if he's coming at any moment they're quite independent quite independent of how you interpret bible prophecy whether you think that i don't know the vaccine is a sign of this that or the other or whether you think that what's going on in israel is significant or the war in ukraine or whatever the latest the latest thing is that's uh, there in the news whether or not all that stuff is relevant to bible prophecy or not is a different issue Put that on one side. But we are to live waiting for his coming imminently. That means at any moment. And that's how it is if you love somebody. You're waiting for them to come back at any moment. Probably heard those old stories in the First World War and all that where, you know, dad or brother or son goes off to fight and no news from him. Oh, he hasn't come back yet and everyone's eager beaver hoping that he's coming back. Maybe he'll come back today. Oh no, maybe tomorrow, no. Every day hoping he's going to come back and then one day, you know, it's a sort of classical kind of uh, story, you know, the, uh, the dad or the brother or whoever does come walking down the garden path and knocks on the door. And so it is a little bit like that. But because we love him, and this is it, do you love Jesus? It's the bottom line, you see. If you love him, then you will want him to come back and you'll be looking for him. And your way of life will be appropriate to someone who is waiting for their master and their loved one to come at any time. So he then gives a little parable. He said, it's like a man, 34, going on a journey. On leaving his house, he put his servants in charge, each according to his assigned tasks. He also commands the gatekeeper to stay awake. Therefore you stay awake, for you do not know when the Lord of the house comes, whether in the evening or at midnight or at cockcrow or in the morning in case he comes suddenly finding you asleep. What I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Well, <clears throat> I said this, you need to compare that with the Lord's parable about the wise and foolish girls, where none of them actually stay awake. But they should do. They should have done, but they didn't. So what it means is that when the Lord Jesus comes back, 
that last generation, which may well be you and me, that last generation will not be spiritually strong. We will be sleepy. We will be only half awake. And unfortunately, that is how we are. Do we believe? Do I believe? Yes, I do. But do we feel that reality? Is this a felt reality in us 24-7? Well, I'm afraid it, it seems not. Because whatever, because of whatever, I was going to say the nature of the world in which we live, but you, you can't make excuses. The point is that probably most of us will not be all bright and bushy-tailed when he comes. Oh, oh, this is Jesus. Oh, yes, I was expecting you. Yes, oh, yes, yes, do come. No, not quite like that, I'm afraid. But he says, what does he mean by watching? How do you stay awake? I don't think he means compare world events against the Bible. That's not what he's saying at all. He says that he is like the man who's gone away. And he's left his house and put his servants in charge. Who are the servants? It's you and me. If you're baptised into the Lord Jesus, you're one of his servants. And we have been put in charge. We, are, we have authority. That's what it means. We have authority. Each according to his assigned tasks. That means that everybody who is baptised into the Lord Jesus has got an assigned task, as he puts it here. In another figure... He says that we are baptised into the body of Jesus. One may be the finger, one may be the ear, the eye, the nose, and so forth. But the point is, we all have a specific role. A man is never better than when he is doing what God wants. So you see, to get baptised, to accept Jesus Christ, to enter the body of Jesus, this is not simply ticking a few boxes and, oh yeah, well, I feel better in my conscience. This is actually a call to have a role in his purpose, to do something for him. You may say, yeah, what's my job then? Well, that's the thing. Ask him. Ask him, Lord, what is your hope for me? What are you looking for from me? What would you like me to do? Now, joy is, as you've noticed, up and along doing the uh, food for us every day, as done for the last month or so. Right? She said that she was praying that prayer. Didn't get any answer, and then stumbled across us and figured, yeah, my job is to do the food down the venue. So if you want to be used, you will be. And one of the things that drives, I think, a lot of depression, even anxiety, even mental health issues, is people feeling that life is pointless. That life is just existence, day by day. One foot in front of the other until I drop into my grave. You know, that is just pointless. It doesn't matter whether you are wealthy, whether you are poor, whether you are a rocket scientist, or whether you've got totally low IQ, live on benefits, whatever. It doesn't make any difference. All the same, everybody struggles with man's search for meaning. Man's search for meaning. What on earth is the point? You know? Absolutely. Victor Frank. Man's search for meaning. This bloke was a Holocaust survivor. Had incredible escapes. You know? Like a hundred men shot on top of him and they didn't get him but all the bodies fell on top of him and then he crawled out and escaped. And then he had another amazing deliverance where, you know, he was saying that the chances of me being alive I like millions to one. And what did I do after the war? I fell into depression. Night. Darkness. Man's search for meaning. And what was all that about anyway? What's the point anyway? Uh, and absolutely. Nothing wrong with feeling like that. That is how it is. As I say, whether you're smart, whether you're stupid, whether you're beautiful or whether you're otherwise, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you've got a great career or whether you've got no career at all, it doesn't make any difference. You've still got the same issues. What on earth is the point? And it is here, you see, that God and his son meet man exactly at our most urgent point and meet our need head on, right on, in a way that nobody and nothing else can each according to his assigned tasks. I have got meaning. I have got a role. 
to do something. You may say, it's all right for you, Duncan, you're, you're there preaching away, yeah, yeah. You've got your job, what about me? Yeah, you have got your circle of people in your life who you know, and you are the light of their world. Actually, they got no other chance apart from you. Because they, they don't go to church, they don't read the Bible, they don't come listen to me. So they got no other chance apart from you. Okay? So when he says, keep awake and watch, I think what he means is get on with your job, with your assigned task, so that when the master comes, you are busy doing something for him. That's what will stop you falling asleep. And <clears throat> therefore, whenever he comes, you'll be ready because you are busy in his service. And this is a totally new way to live. It's a new paradigm. It's a new worldview, a new way to look at life that I'm not just trudging, trudging onwards, you know, mile by mile, step by step towards an eternal grave. As I say, whether you trudge in, you know, 500 quid night trainers or barefoot, it doesn't make any difference. You're still trudging on. This is the way to live. This is the way to be. Not just exist, but to live. As God and the Lord Jesus would have us. And of course, that life is actually, as he says in John's Gospel so often, the life eternal. That is the life that you and me can live forever. Not to pass the bread and the juice out. So, we're going to take the bread and the juice that represents the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. And it's because of him. It's because of his sacrifice that we are able to have this opportunity to live and not exist, but to live forever, to be with him forever. And as I said earlier, eating and drinking with him is a sign of his acceptance of you. If I'm, I'm at the door, the Lord says, and I'm knocking at the door. And if any man open and let me in, I will eat with him and he will eat with me. And you see, by taking this bread and this, this wine, alcohol-free wine, we are saying that, yes, I open to you, Lord. That's why anyone can take the bread and the juice and the wine. You're welcome. He's knocking on the door and he wants to come in. So let's, um, let's give thanks for the bread and the, uh, and the wine. Well, actually, Spyro, would you like to give us a prayer for the bread and the wine? It's great to see you, Spiros. We haven't seen you for a while. Sir? Oh, some bread and wine over here for Ian, please. Right, uh, Spyro, would you like to give us a prayer for the uh, for the for the uh, problems? Thank you.